So you came to Canada in 1953. Why Canada? Well, at the time, right after the war, there were you know a lot of you know after the uh, there was a devastation in Italy and uh, there was a lot of poverty in Italy. So people were trying to better their life, and I guess my father at the time felt that he wanted uh, something better for himself. For my mother and his family, there was three of us in the family, three kids. And he decided to come uh, overseas to North America. I think he would have preferred going to the United States, but at the time uh, uh, the American uh, immigration was close to the Italians, and he chose to come to Canada because we had an uncle here that uh, he called him over, and I'm glad he did decide to come to Canada. And uh, so this is uh, why he came to Canada in Toronto. And he came in 1951, actually. He came by himself, and then he worked a couple of years, and in 1953 he called us over. And I came over uh, with my mother, my brother, and my sister. What was your journey like when you first arrived in Canada? It wasn't easy to leave Italy, you know, to leave my friends and everything. And I'll never forget when we left Italy. As a matter of fact, I just came back from a trip uh, from Italy. I was there on business a few days ago. And uh, I went to Naples because uh, we buy a lot of tomatoes, we bring a lot of tomatoes from Italy. And somebody came to pick me up and I begged him because I had never been in Naples uh, because I left Italy in 1953 from Naples by boat. And uh, I had never been back to Naples. I mean, I go back to Italy a lot, but I would never been back to Naples. And I asked the guy, please take me to the pier. When I left, I wanted to see, I want to see if I can remember something. And of course, I remember a castle that it's in... Uh, right by the pier and uh, and there was a boat there and the guy told me this is pier 52 I think that's where exactly where most of the boats were leaving and I got a little bit emotional because I can never forget that uh, cold night in January that I left in 1953 standing on the bridge the boat left about 12 o'clock at night and I was standing all alone on the bridge because my mother and uh, my brother and sister they all gone to bed and uh, Standing on a bridge, looking at the city of Naples, the boat pulling off from the pier, a very little, and me, because the boat was pulling off, and I thought, you know, I'll never see Italy again, because, you know, in those days, uh, and I'm talking in 1953, it's not like today, where you go in the, in the eight hours, you go back, back and forth. And in those days, you know, it took you 10 days by boat, and then all the people that I've known that had lived in Canada, that have lived in the United States, it took them 25 years to come back to Italy because you know money was not available the way it is today so I thought it's going to take me 20 years 30 years to come back to Italy and I know if I'll ever see this land again and you know it, it was hard that night it was hard sure so when you when you arrived in Canada at 15 mm. that's obviously a very hard time what was it like what was your journey what, what, what did where did you start what did you do well you have to understand that I've never worked a day in my life I I was going to school like I said and we arrived in uh, in Halifax at the uh, now famous Pier 21 that everybody talks about it. And I'll never forget that morning. Uh, there was another morning that uh, we were all excited we, because we were going to see the new land. And that was the 22nd of January 1953, I remember, like uh, like yesterday. And we got out uh, outside on a boat and we couldn't see the harbor. We couldn't see anything because it was all snowing like crazy and cold, cold, cold. But we finally... Uh, docked and uh, we went into where the custom was and uh, where everybody you know they looked at what we had and everything and then uh, and that was a very uh, cold feeling see, to be in this room hardly nobody could speak anything I spoke a little bit of French and they spoke a little bit of French with me and I understood and uh, then they put us on a train and it took us two days to get here I'll, I'll never forget the voyage on the train uh, watching uh, the movie Dr. Zavago uh, later on in years reminded me of the train that I came from Halifax to Toronto where we used to stop, that train used to stop on the side track to let all the other trains go by because you know we were immigrants you know and we <laughs> I guess we were in those days second class citizen and uh, like I said it took us two days to get to Toronto and, uh, and then we got to Toronto I never forget at the Union Station, came out of the station was about, my father was waiting at the station for us and of course that was a relief, you know, I saw my father after two years, so you forget that you left Italy, you're in the excitement of the family being together again and I'll never forget coming out of the station, everything, I think the first thing I saw was the Royal York Hotel right across from where I came out 
and everything seemed big to me. The cars were big, the streets were big, the Royal York was big in those days, and of course we did not have all the buildings that we have now. And uh, my father had a f cousin of ours who had a, who had a car, who had a big car. Uh, they don't make them anymore, but I remember even the make. Packard was just like those big, huge Cadillacs, you know, that they used to use in the 50s. And uh, we, went, we all went into this car. This car was big, and I, I just couldn't get over the fact how big the car was, because don't forget, I had just left Italy, where they had the little Fiat. <laughs> and uh, we went home, we had uh, supper over my hands, and then he took us uh, to our house where we were going to live, two rooms, which was even maybe bigger than some, uh, what some of the people had in those days. And uh, that was on a Thursday night, and on a Monday morning, I went to work with my father. And uh, he used to work, uh, because my father used to be in the Air Force before he came over. He was a bookbinder, uh, but when he came, he had to uh, adapt himself to do anything, to earn some money so he could keep his family. And he was working in a place where they used to make chairs. Uh, you know. uh, I remember the company, Firestone Chairs Company, right up Dufferin, uh, Dufferin and Eglinton. And on a Monday morning, I went to work with him in his factory. Never worked a day in his life, and uh, it wasn't easy, you know. But you came here and you had to help the family, you know, because the dream for my my mother was to have her own home, because in Italy, you now they thought that uh, as long as they stayed over there, it would be very hard to get uh, her own home. Things have changed in Italy, of course. All my father's friends, they all have homes. They all done well, but in those days, uh, it thought was an impossible dream. And we came here to this country, and uh, like I said, and the first and second day, uh, after two days, my, and uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, we used to live on a dam fort. We used to go by streetcar to Dufferin. Dufferin, we used to take a streetcar, and we used to, at Eglinton, after Eglinton, there were no streetcars, buses. And I used to walk for about two miles every morning in the cold to go to this factory where we used to work. And uh, the second or third day, my father had to work overtime. So he said to me, he said, can you go home alone? Do you remember how to go home alone? I said, yes, I remember. So I did, and I did go, I walked. More with Joe Vitale after the break. Around the age of 18 or 19 years old, I felt that uh, I wanted something more out of life, you know. And uh, I always had this thing that I wanted to sell, sell, sell. I always wanted to sell. And uh, of course, I tried to deliver a newspaper even when I was a uh, when I was a kid. Tried to do, it. and uh, and then finally, I think I was about 19, 20. Uh, I got this opportunity. This uh, this husband and wife team, they, they had a small cheese company. And uh, I went to them and I said, uh, uh, could I sell for them, you know? And they asked me, have you ever sold before? I said, no, I never sold before, but I know most of the Italian people, because in those days the Italians, they had a lot of grocery stores, you know? And I said, I know most of the Italian people in the grocery store, I didn't know anybody. So they gave me a chance, you know? And uh, I sold for about three weeks, they went broke. They closed on me. They didn't even pay me for one week. And but what are you going to do? In those days, things like that did happen. So again, I was left out of a job. 
And uh, then I said, maybe selling is not my, my cup of tea. Maybe I want to learn a trade because, you know, you want to make something of yourself. And I joined the, in those days, uh, uh, Chrysler had the new product out there, automatic transmission. I figured, let me go learn that because, you know, people are making a lot of money in this. But, uh, I went there for about two, three years and I didn't like it. So then I came back and I went to work for a food company again. And they asked me if I had worked in the food company before. I gave them the name of the company that went broke. I told them that I was working there for about two years. It was a lie. And they, there was no way they could check because I told them that they went broke. And they gave me a, uh, they gave me a chance. And I worked there for three years. The name of the company was Branson. They used to be in the tomatoes business. And then from there, uh, there was another company. They started a new pasta company in Toronto. Now we go back to the pasta. And uh, the name of the company was Romy Food. And I went to work for them. And uh, I worked about, for about three years. Uh, I was the number one salesman there. And uh, I did very, very well there. As a matter of fact, I thought that my dream was to earn $100 a week and have a company car. And I succeeded in having $100 a week and a company car, a small station wagon. And I remember going home uh, that night with the station where I was singing like crazy that finally my dream came true. Yeah. I did what I wanted to do, and uh, I'm doing it my way, and I'm getting $100. And then, of course, from there on, then three years later, I had, uh, I got to know some people at Primo. Primo was just starting when they were very young. Uh, I got to meet the man that owned Primo company, and uh, I decided to go to work uh, for him. And I spent 27 years there. I became uh, one of the shareholders in the company, and uh, good 27 years. The man died, and uh, he, we owned about uh, 20 per about a group of us, about four or five of us owned about 20 percent of the company. And he died. He left his estate in a trust that they decided to sell. We were forced to sell. We tried to do a management buyout. The best thing that happened to me, we tried to do a management buyout. And we were unable to do it because somebody from the States came and offered at least three times of what we were able to offer. We took our money. Everybody went on vacation. Everybody went on the holidays. Everybody bought the property in Florida. They all retired. And me, I, I decided to invest it all. They told me I was crazy. I was sick. I was going to lose it all. Why does he need it? But what's he trying to prove? He's going against two giants. At the time, there was Lanch and Primo, which Primo, and there was Borden and Scatelli. He's nuts. He's going to lose it all. Well, I'm still here today after, uh, since 1989, for 13 years I've been here. So you had a very successful career while you were involved with Primo Foods. How did you know that there would be a global market for pasta? At the time, you know, pasta was just, uh, uh, people were getting to learn pasta in this country. They were getting to love pasta. And the import of pasta from Italy, there was non-existent. So everything was, whatever they bought in pasta in the United States, everything was made in the U.S. And the U.S. in those days did not make a very good product when it came to pasta. And uh, so when I got the job at Primo, I was asked by, there was a man such, a, his name was Primo. I was asked by him, he says, Joe, he says, what is it that you want to do? You want to get your route here in Toronto, you know, we have a district where you can work. Oh, we're thinking of exporting to the United States. We don't know how it's going to go. We have no customers at all. That's blank. What do you want to do? I always looked for a challenge in my life. I'm a guy that doesn't stay quiet that much, you know. I said, you know what? I want to try the United States. Never been in the U.S. before. Never knew where New York was. I knew that it was, I had been to Niagara Falls, uh, Ontario, and I knew that on the other side there was the United States. Niagara Falls, New York. I didn't even know how far it was and everything. I got in my car the first day and I just kept going and I went to New York. And I remember before I got to New York, I stopped in about uh, Utica, New York. I stopped with Utica, New York, because uh, uh, it's a long drive, you know, between Toronto and New York. I stopped there for the night and I remember picking up the yellow pages, looking at the yellow pages. I mean, I'm selling pasta. Who am I going to go sell pasta? I got to look for an Italian distributor, right, or an Italian store, whatever. That. And I'm looking for all the Italian names. <laughs> and in the morning, I went to all around the Utica area to see if I could find an Italian distributor. Everybody loved me. Everybody loved the product, but nobody bought, you know. <laughs> then I went as far as New York, and again, I went to, 
to see some people in New York, and uh, nothing happened. So I came back to Toronto. Then the week after, I went to Boston again. I went to Philadelphia, went all the area that I thought there was a lot of uh, center for the Italian population, you know. And finally, the first break started to come in. I started to sell, and then, like I said, the rest of history with Primo we used to do quite a bit of quite a bit of export. Why did you feel there should be a Canadian manufacturer of dry pasta? A Primo was a Canadian at the time that we owned. The Primo was owned by Canadians. And I think even Lancia was owned by Canadian. But once Primo was sold, there was no more uh, uh, Canadian-owned company. Because Lancia, Catelli, they were all owned by Americans. Primo now was owned by Americans. And I felt we needed a Canadian identity. And uh, I thought that, that maybe I can be that Canadian identity to be in the pasta business. How important has your family been as a support network in your career? Well, don't forget, my, my family, my kids were very young. They were going to school, actually. One was involved in hockey. He even uh, went to scholarship in the United States, the one you met. And they were both going to school. They were very supportive in everything I did, but never physically, not, not to, but they were always behind. A anything that I did, they were always behind. And if we want to go back even to my father and my mother, they always felt whatever I wanted to, they, were, uh, they always supported me. How do you balance career and family so well? It's not easy. Let's put it this way. It's not easy, especially if you travel. And, and in those days, I used to travel a lot. I just used to come home uh, just for weekends. But uh, I always followed my kids uh, in school. I was always interested. And I remember even through my work and through my traveling, I always find time, especially when my older son was uh, going to school in the United States and he was playing hockey in the United States, you know, because he was there on a hockey scholarship. I always managed to, to stop the business and go to see him playing. So we were be, my two sons were always been very, very, very close. And we're still close today. How does it feel to be recognized as one of Canada's top 50 best managed companies for three years in a row? Uh, you know what? I thought it was a very good honor. I did never thought, I mean, whoever thought that I, uh, uh, a young boy, 15 years old, standing on a boat, crying because it was coming to and not knowing what the future was going to be, whoever thought that after so many years I was going to be recognized by uh, Arthur Anderson and uh, the Financial Post to have one of the best managed company. It was a, a dream. Uh, you cannot say it was a dream come true because it was not even a dream. It was something that came true. I mean, something that was unexpected, and, you know. And uh, sure, I was very, very proud of being an immigrant coming from Italy, you know, and, uh, and uh, I liked it. How important is being Canadian to you? To me, being Canadian is very, very important, but uh, it's also we have to know where we come from. We can never forget where we come from, but Canadians should come first. The thing that, uh, uh, because you know, you have to know your past. I always say, even to my kids, if you don't know the past, you have no future. It's very important, and I feel bad, because you see, even in the United States, it's important to be American, but in the United States, you're an American first. And then, and I wish we had that in Canada too, because, I don't know, I believe in multiculturalism, I believe in everybody have their own identity, but sometimes we forget that we're Canadian first, you know, like we all are to this country. And a lot of us, like, you know, a lot of people that come from all over, whether it's Italy, France, England, whatever, they put their own nationality ahead of Canada. And I say that's wrong. If we live in this country, Canada should be first. And then, sure. If we we have to be very proud to where we come from. I would not trade where I was born with any. I'm very proud of the fact that I was born in Italy. I'm very proud of Italy. I still think Italy is a beautiful country, but Canada is my mother country. I mean, Italy is my mother country, but country is my country of adoption. And sometimes you can adopt, you can love your adopted kids much more than you can your own. Now, you're involved in a number of different charities. Tell me about what they are and why you're involved in them. Well, we're very much involved with um, the big brothers, you know, and big sisters, because these are kids that they have uh, no mothers, no father, or not that they, they have them, but they've been abandoned them. And to me, there's always been a soft, I have a soft spot for, uh, for uh, kids, for people that need help, and, uh, 
and that's one of my main charity that would involve. I'm also involved in uh, Caritas. It's again, it's a charitable thing for uh, people that have uh, been drugged and uh, they have all these problems with drinking, and they get involved with them. And uh, we also get involved with sick children, sick children hospital. Again, children, children. I, I don't know why I have, uh, I have a weakness for kids. What's one of the most influential things in your life? It's hard to say, but I really believe that my five years that I spent in a seminary, they, had, um, they helped me form my character, you know, a lot of things that I do today that I think I've learned in the seminary. And I think the people in the, the being in the seminary, I think, was very influential in my future. And of course, you know, uh, my mother, my father. My mother is still living today. She's 85 years old. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm planning to take her on a, a boat cruise in July because it's going to be for her 85th birthday. And she's a very strong supporter of me. And uh, we sit and we talk and uh, we exchange things. Every Saturday I have lunch with her, with my sons, and uh, we talk about everything. And uh, every time I got to let loose or I got to let go, I still go to her and she listens to me. Any regrets? No, no regrets. Secrets to your success? Work hard. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Thank you, Mr. Vitelli, for joining me this afternoon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming. Thank you for... Uh, I was looking uh, forward to meeting you. I finally got to meet you. And uh, lots of luck with your show. And uh, thank you for coming again. <laughs>